Well, welcome. I'm Paul Rudy. I'm here with our regular cast of characters, Dr. Fred Gertz. Dr. Fred's in the state uh, station. Good Andrew morning. Jacker. Well, my voice is going a little bit. And uh, certified financial planner and retirement income certified professional, David Rudy. David, welcome. Thanks for having me. And I'm just adjusting my uh, earphones here a little bit. And I have financial advisor, Ryan Repko, who also works with, with us at Rudy Wealth Management. Ryan, good morning. Good morning. You can call in with your questions with at 217-356-9397 or text us on your Castle Heating and Cooling line at 351-5357. You can also email your questions to talk at wdws.com. That's right, Daniel. I'm sucking in my gut because, you know, we're on Facebook Live now, you know, and I noticed, wow, who's the big fat guy? <laughs> I realized it was me. Uh, you can also, we also want to welcome, as I said, those tuning in on Facebook Live. The last couple of shows, we've had people live from Texas to Florida all the way to Vietnam. I think I mentioned that last time. Uh, I think Paul has a friend in Vietnam. It's important to recognize that the past, uh, the past performance is not an indication of future results. You should not make any investment decisions without <clears throat> first consulting your own financial advisor and conducting your own research and due diligence. Well, Fred, great. Glad to have you back. Right. Good to be here. Uh, I guess you were out, uh, you know, you're always, you travel a lot. Uh, occasionally. I went to a, a meeting about uh, investments, and it's always uh, uh, a bunch of exotic options that uh, probably aren't particularly uh, good, but at least it's interesting to hear about them. Yeah, there's always something. Uh, do you ever get the sense that everything old is new again, you know, every now and then? Right, right. And uh, even old things <laughs> Uh, continue to be old, but uh, there's, there's always, uh, as I've said many times, when you go to a meeting or go to a free lunch or whatever, it's almost never about passive investments. It's always some kind of active option that turns out uh, pretty costly and probably not uh, necessarily the best choice for most people. Yeah, I occasionally get things in the mail. Uh, I call them plate liquor dinners. I know that's not a very eloquent thing to call them, but that's kind of what they're called in the industry. Um, you know, you get invited to a fancy restaurant to hear somebody speak about investing, et cetera. And there's, there's generally, in my 35 years of experience, there's usually a, something quite costly that goes along with it. That may, may be where the term came from, uh, no free lunch. <laughs> yeah, that's true. There's no free lunch. Well, Fred, I, when I look at the macro data, it seems like mostly pointing to positive growth. Um, you know, everywhere I look, Sure doesn't smell like a recession is uh, imminent anytime, at least in 2018. Um, you, you get that? You share that? Right. Uh, what used to be a, uh, a negative, I think, has become a positive now. This uh, very slow recovery uh, was uh, very painful the first uh, several years after the recession. But uh, more recently now, we, we're, we're approaching a record in terms of the longest expansion and uh, that slow uh, steady growth has actually turned into some pretty positive things, in particular, uh, very low unemployment right now. So again, the the, the only negative things are really not negative; they're more uh, sort of chronological. That uh, most expansions don't uh, last ten years, and we're approaching ten years now. But there's nothing that says that there's a, an expiration date at ten years either. So we can let's see how far this goes. Especially after a 2008, 2009. Not that that's unprecedented. I mean, we can go back yeah. to the 20s and 30s. Uh, in the very early 40s, I suppose, uh, pre-war. Um, but it was an unusual period of decline uh, as far as what happened. Right. And then almost depressionary uh, in a, an extent. A lot of people thought we were going into a depression, and we might have even been close. Right. But is, do you just ever think maybe because it's been such a slow grind, what I call a plow horse kind of recovery, uh, that that's what's giving it some of its longevity. I know it's possible to uh, probably know. Probably so. Uh, the uh, the typical uh, uh, post war recession that was very severe usually had a very strong um, recovery. Like they often call it a V kind of thing, where it would go down sharply and then recover pretty quickly. Uh, this was down sharply, but it didn't recover quickly, and that's probably because of the financial crisis and the uh, kind of unusual nature of the of the uh, 2007 to 2009 recession. So obviously it was a painful thing, but uh, it's behind us now. And uh, again, uh, there's nothing particularly uh, on the horizon to suggest it's going to end. The Fed keeps uh, raising interest rates. They said they right. would. Uh, I saw that year-over-year -year compensation in the most recent un uh, employment report was 2.6% real year-over-year, -year, which means net of inflation. Um, is that starting to, to push up? The yeah, sort of the the uh, third 
um, the third part of the recovery. The, uh, I think we talked about this on other occasions, but the first part of the recovery was the economy started to grow again, but unemployment didn't come down and wages were stagnant. The second uh, thing that fell in place was that uh, unemployment started to fall, so we had a real growth and lower unemployment, but there was still not much wage growth, so now we have the final uh, thing in place, which is wage growth in addition. So again, when you get down to uh, 3.9 unemployment, uh, you would expect there to be some pressure on wages at this point. Uh, it just, uh, I always I always wondered about that because inflation still remains kind of near the target, 2% target for the Federal Reserve, it appears. Uh, so that hasn't really kicked up yet, but it seems like wage inflation is that one right. maybe push that well, they actually, could be a big component uh, yeah, of it. The Fed is kind of hedged on that now and saying that uh, 2% is a kind of long-term goal, so don't be surprised if you go above 2% for before uh, they before get, go back to 2%. So again, it suggests that uh, there's a limit to fine-tuning and you can have goals, but you can't necessarily achieve those goals precisely. Yeah. Well, it just seems like, you know, uh, and over the years uh, – there's this term called a Goldilocks recovery. Yeah. Uh, not too hot, not too cool. Uh, certainly not a lot of pressures in the pipeline for inflation. Yeah. And maybe that's why we continue to... And, and corporate profitability has been right. terrific. It continues to be uh, on a really good pace uh, on a forward earnings basis. And uh, it just, you know, there's a lot... It's, there's no shortage of bad news bears out there that for, for years and years and years now, it's kind of getting a little bit old. Uh, singing the song that, you know, any day now we're in for some doom and some gloom, but uh, they seem to be being right. defied. Yeah, the the uh, usual kind of uh, obligatory caveat is that uh, uh, people aren't particularly good at predicting inflation, so uh, I'm, I'm predicting recession. So uh, the fact that uh, there's no particular reason to believe one's coming doesn't mean it won't happen, but again, there's nothing on the horizon that would necessarily indicate that. A lot of those things you might typically look at is the yield curve inverted, that is, is the two-year treasury uh, have a higher yield, more, a higher yield than the 10-year treasury. Yeah. But even, and we don't have that condition, but I talk about it frequently, uh, but usually that condition exists for quite a long time, as a really la long lag time. Housing starts would be another thing that would tend to degrade. Those are near yeah. all-time highs and yeah. really But the strong. rising interest rate, though, we talked about is, is probably, in a sense, a positive sign. It means that uh, there's enough confidence in the economy they can start uh, being a little bit uh, uh, tighter with monetary policy. And again, people probably noticed that for, after years and years, there are actually ads in the paper now about CDs and 2% rates and uh, two percent plus, and so on. And of course, that feels better, because but that's your nominal rate. It's certainly yeah. better than a tenth right. of a percent or a quarter of a percent. But, but people should always, I you know, I'm pretty consistent on this. While that feels better, and there's, and, and I'm not here saying there's anything wrong with it, but take a two and a half percent CD. You might give up a half percent of it in taxation. Ultimately, it's going to get taxed that interest. And right now we have 2% inflation, at least the official inflation. So you're still, even at a 2.5% CD, you're still really treading water. You're really not getting a return net of taxes and inflation. Uh, but it's certainly a good safe store of money type of place if you absolutely want to preserve your principal. That is your dollars. Um, you know, doing that for 30 years is probably isn't that advisable because you can perfectly you can uh, perfectly protect your principal but lose half your money with just trend line inflation i'm going to shift to a blog that <clears throat> uh, my son paul recently wrote to explain wealth management guys i think we take you know there's how, you know how many firms are in the country or you know name something uh, wealth management like our we're rudy wealth management just an example i think we often take for granted what that people even know what wealth management means so ryan <clears throat> i'm going to throw out the first question to you in your own words, uh, how would you tell somebody what wealth man? How would you describe wealth management? And when a firm says they're a wealth management firm, we're not speaking for all wealth management firms, by the way, but just in general sense. I think it's just a perspective of taking all the assets that you had accumulated over the course of your life and putting those into place to give you the best lifestyle possible when you need that money. And so just as it's a common sense answer, just something that as you're accumulating your money and you need that money down the road, you do it sensibly and with a plan and a goal. Oh, I think that 
uh, I think that's a sensible explanation. Probably would be similar to mine. I'm going to go to a text. Uh, Hi, Mr. Rudy and the boys. And by the way, you can call us on the Castle text line at 351-5357, just as a reminder. Uh, Hi, Mr. Rudy and the boys. I have a question. When it comes to investing, uh, is there anything you all as a group really agree on? And more importantly, is there anything you disagree on? And what is that? And who is right? So we'll take that part of the question first. There's, there's a couple of questions here that I think are pretty decent. Um, can you guys think of anything while we sit around and, and maybe debate? I know we have a recent one uh, that we've been uh, noodling. Uh, when it comes down to maybe, is there any uh, tactical allocation that might be appropriate? I've been doing a lot of research, and I'm starting to be a little more open to it. And I will tell you, son David is very rigid against it. Uh, that's a recent one. Um, I think I tell you one area. Uh, my and it's Mike and Champagne. Uh, look, I'm the guy that's been in this for 35 years, and a new client comes in and they, you know, hand over a million dollars. It's their lifestyle that we're protecting, that we're responsible for. And suppose uh, the majority of it is currently in CDs or high quality bonds, and maybe we determine that half of the portfolio value for the next two to three decades purpose needs to be ownership represented by the ownership of the great companies of America and the world or the stock market. I at all time highs tend to, and you guys probably you can add into this. I tend to be chicken and I like to dollar cost average if they're not already at a 50%, you know, or at the target allocation. And I might take as much as six months to, put that money into its stock market allocation. And if the stock market gives us a nice decline, I'll speed it up. But I'll do what's called dollar cost averaging in the position. Uh, Daniel's here working on the Facebook thing, so he's not going to be mic'd. But David, I think you probably, uh, I think you share Daniel's thoughts that if it belongs in the stock market, it belongs there by three o'clock today. Yeah, because objectively, that is the correct answer. If you look at, you know, even six month periods, I'm, I don't know the number for six month periods, but using a year, I know the number is the market's up about 75% of the time over a one year period. So say your dollar cost averaging over a year, 75% of the time, you're going to be worse off having done that. Um, but where you're coming from, I mean, I, I totally understand it. And I agree. And there's probably a, a certain amount of it depends on the client and their psychological demeanor is, yeah, that sounds great. But it's kind of gets back to maybe the objectively best answer is not something that the client can actually stay invested in. In other words, if we were to dump them in, in their full equity exposure right off the bat, and then that's the very start of a 30% market decline, well, maybe they're going to think we don't know what we're doing or the, the market's going to go lower or whatever. Psychologically, they're not going to be able to handle that and they're going to sell out and they're never going to get back in or they're going to get back in way too late. Well, then that's way more costly than the small cost of potentially foregone returns due to dollar cost averaging. So technically, the answer would be if it belongs in, it belongs in today by sundown. But from a practical standpoint, I, I call it easing the emotion of regret. I sometimes have to make a judgment call on that with the tip the client's personality, their attitude towards uh, fluctuation, et cetera. Uh, so that's a, I think that's a real clear example where we do sit around and probably don't always agree on that. I, I have an example that maybe we should talk a little bit about what we do agree on. I think first and foremost is keeping costs super low and being super diversified. I think those are two kind of no-brainer answers that we all fundamentally believe in and agree in. And honestly, it's kind of hard to to disagree with that. I can't imagine anyone, you know, taking the other side of those things. All well, other people that do it. In in fact, well, I'll take it even a little bit further. It's this idea that markets work too. That's a big part of our philosophy that markets work. And you're better off keeping your costs investment costs low harnessing the returns of the broad market globally as opposed to trying to pick winners and losers from uh you know f from a stock picking standpoint mm -hmm. uh, that's that's a philosophy i've had for 30 years or so now um and i was very early in into that side of the world and as you said it's hard not to be if somebody will actually read the research yeah it's also uh hard to have discipline uh, I, I was talking about going to a meeting and almost everyone at the meeting would say uh market timing is a uh 
a loser's game. You don't want to do that. But yet uh, about 10 different people said, well, we've had this expansion now going on for nine years. You've had all these gains. What do you do about protecting them? Which is really just another uh, backdoor way of, of yeah. market timing. So to avoid that, the, the uh, thing you should do would be rebalancing, not, uh, not necessarily waiting around to decide when it's going to go up or go down. Yeah. So uh, any, you guys think of anything else that kind of sticks out that uh, I think it's a good question um, because if you go into a lot of firms, and my experience has been not everybody necessarily shares the same philosophy. I, I, I got to be honest. I don't think I would hire anybody, including my own children, if there was a philosophical fundamental issue that because at the end of the day, I'm going to make that call <clears throat> and I want us to all be on the same page. I think it's that consistent message that clients are looking for. If I'm not in the office and they come in and that Ryan happens to be there, they're going to get the same answer from him. It might be a little different delivery, uh, probably less blunt than me <laughs> uh, <laughs> delivery. Um, you know, if they come in and ask Daniel or David or if Paul's in town, they ask him, you're going to get, you're never going to get a mixed message. And I don't know if that's good or bad. I think clients tell us it's good. Um, even with our newsletter, it's that consistency. Uh, I tell a funny story. Years ago, I stopped writing my, at that point, I was doing a monthly newsletter. And I decided, well, I'm just saying the same thing over and over again. I'm just trying to figure out new ways to say old stuff. And for, for three or four months, I quit writing it. And I had a revolt on my hand. <clears throat> and I asked people, I, I would just tell them, I said, well, I stopped writing it because I felt like I was just saying the same thing over and over again. And a number of them commented, that's the whole point. That's that consistency of the message that keeps us sane, that keeps us invested, that keeps us, you know, from seeing the obstacles. We get to, you know, we, we look at, keeps the faith, patience, and the discipline that's required. So it's that long-term historical perspective, maybe delivered by an adult memory, uh, that's, that's very helpful. So the other question, I thought this is interesting. This is more of a personality question or, or a, a family dynamic question. It's, and this is from Mike and Champagne. One more thing. This is for the boys and Mr. Rudy. <clears throat> uh, were you forced to get into this work because your dad is doing it? <laughs> <laughs> you, probably, you would think, knowing me, you'd have to force them. Uh, or is this something you wanted to do? Sometimes, for example, help with college may influence what a person does. In other words, if I'm sponsoring college, <laughs> it's kind of like army recruiter. If I'm going to pay for college, you have to give me four years on the line. Uh, you know, <clears throat> so that's kind of, kind of an interesting, more of a family dynamic personality question mm -hmm. uh, that maybe you guys can address. Yeah, I think I can probably answer it. And I feel like Daniel and Paul would say the exact same thing that I would is I honestly felt absolutely no pressure to go into this particular industry, in my particular case, I, you know, we all have interests outside of financial planning that we're pretty passionate about. Um, and when I was in college, I was kind of between like maybe pre-med or something like more um, like physical therapy related. Those were kind of the two I was thinking about and then financial planning. But I think the reason we all ended up going into this was, you know, if you look back on our childhood and you were able to have a certain amount of flexibility owning your own business and just having the type of job you don't necessarily have to be in the office eight to five. You know, you could coach our little league baseball teams. You could do a lot of things that we wanted to be able to do for our eventual children. None of us have any right now, but you know, I think there's a certain amount of that. And then also seeing just the, you know, the positive influence you can have on people's lives. And I think that's pretty cool. And, and, and they all had a f finance degree. Uh, Ryan, you have a master's in business administration from the U of I. And, uh, I know you were thinking about the medical school route yourself, like a lot of your friends, but then yeah. you got kind of the finance bug. Mm -hmm. I probably got to you early on that one. <laughs> see, when you met I Katie, was, you didn't know what you were in for. I didn't. I didn't know it was coming my way, but I think I kind of fought that more than anything. It's like, oh, I'm not going to follow the, the Paul Rudy mentality of markets work and just assume that everything that you say is the gospel it was just you just assumed everything i said was <laughs> not true right it's <laughs> kind of good a question from time to time it keeps you healthy but i think i came around to it when i heard the same consistent me message in undergrad that i also heard repeated again in my graduate studies and then once again in the uh, certified financial planning studies it became a resounding uh, bell that this isn't just paul's theories this is truly the most practical and efficient way to manage money 
Well, I did tell you I was the one that did all the research, probably, mm-hmm. instead of somebody else doing all the research. <laughs> well, that's a, that's a great question, Mike. Thanks for uh, uh, chiming in. You can call us at 356-9397 or the Castle Heating and uh, Cooling text line, 351-5357. So great to hear from, from Mike. We were talking about before uh, that text came in, wealth management. Ryan kind of gave it a three you know, uh, stool, uh, three legged stool. Uh, wealth management means you're going to have a financial plan that spells out your goals. Uh, you're going to have an investment portfolio des- uh, designed to fund those goals. In other words, it's a slave to the portfolio. I mean, the portfolio is a slave to the plan. And a trusted financial advisor committed to the plan is going to make adjustments. So, uh, David, so let's talk about each of those individual pieces, um, kind of the whys and the wherefores, why they're, each one is important in its own fashion. And, uh, and, and why is it that those are the three legs and why, did, why are those the necessary ingredients for investment success or investor success? Well, I think it comes down to they're, they're all important. And if you're missing any one of those pieces, chances are you're not going to end up doing what, like Ryan said, is really the goal of all of this is to kind of lead the best life possible with the money that you have. Um, so the first one, like just thinking of a financial plan, it's really stating, well, what, how do I want to live my life? What do I want to accomplish with my money? And then that will basically inform all of the other more objective financial decisions that you make to make sure that you give yourself the best chance of accomplishing those things. So in other words, it's important that your money and your portfolio is pointed at something. It's just not this arbitrary cork floating around in this ocean of investments, seemingly bobbing any whichever way the markets go. It's your 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 portfolio is pointed to something that's really a key and i think a way that i think about it too is you know at the end of the day money is a means to an end i don't know that many people whose goal is just to accumulate a big pile of money for the sake of accumulating a big pile of money it's it's what that money represents it what's it's what they that it allows them to do it's you know lead a certain lifestyle for themselves or be able to you know fund their grandchildren's education or leave money to a charitable cause they care about at at some point there is an end for this money that that people want to start managing it for and maybe on the front end they don't quite in specific terms know what that is but probably uh you guys can weigh in but it seems like people people in their 60s or 70s or 80s probably because of the way they grew up in the shadows of the depression they seem to only be able to spend so much money on stuff after that, it seems to be it all centers around gifting to our children. Why wait till we're the richest person in the cemetery? Let's speed that up. Let's let's look for opportunities to do that. And then also from a charitable standpoint, those seem to be two of the more common themes that we get. Uh, you know, there's all these rules, guys, the 4% rule. How much can I safely withdraw? And everybody, all the focus is always about running out of money. Well, are you for, you know, and I've even done commercials. Are you, you going to outlive your money? Is your money going to outlive you? I think that sometimes taints this too. It, it strikes me that this is the whole point about having a financial plan that drives the allocation, that drives the portfolio. If done properly, more than likely, at every stage of retirement, you're going to be pretty close to the zenith of your asset. I mean, your asset uh, portfolio values. And our experience is, even though clients spend money, now this, again, we have to give it the past performance is no indication of future results. So we, we can't draw too many conclusions. I'm, uh, anecdotally, though, and, and look, I've, I guess the stock market's been pretty powerful in my 35 years, but if I look at the last 15 to 17 years, really below average returns, yet most people that have a plan, a good plan and a good planner <clears throat> are finding that even though they're spending substantial amounts of money, their portfolio continues to grow. And that's really what creates this legacy issue and the ability to, they're not going to spend it, but spending becomes gifting and gifting becomes charitable as well. So it's not just family. So The other thing you mentioned, Dave, uh, Ryan mentioned, is a trusted financial advi- uh, advisor. And, and the kind of key words were committed to the plan and portfolio and were able to make adjustments. Um, is that where you see guys, the difficulty people that are operating without a plan, whether it's their own plan that they've designed or by a financial planner, I think that to me in my 35 years is that's probably the hardest part is when and how to make the adjustments 
whether we're in a period of euphoria, it's a new era thinking, or a period of really pervasive pessimism, that's where the big mistakes are made around the turning points. And I think that's where people really struggle. Yeah. One other point, too. I think the uh, uh, point was made here that you want a, a comprehensive plan. And uh, some people uh, obviously think uh, diver having a diversified portfolio is a good idea, which is true, but not having diversified uh, planners is not necessarily a good idea. You don't want to have two or three diff different people planning the your, your situation. Uh, sometimes I get the question, I, I know someone who I inherited – a hundred thousand dollars. What should I do with it? Well, there's no way to answer that right. unless you know what they're doing with all their right. other assets. So you need to have a centralized kind of plan, not just a bunch of d different yeah. people planning for you. Yeah, I think that's key, Fred. Um, I, I think with with I see too many people out there that they like this idea of diversification. They, they, I'm just going to pick up on something you said. Diversification. When we talk about it, it means we really want to be diversified within asset classes. Uh, in across asset classes. In other words, if we're going to be in small companies as part of our portfolio, we want to basically own all of them. If we're going to be in large companies, we want to own all of them. So that's within asset classes. And then when I mentioned these other asset classes like emerging markets or small companies or value, those are asset classes and you want perhaps a variety of those. Then it comes to this idea of, well, should I be diversified, as you said, Fred, as far as financial advisors? And and, and I have very strong beliefs on this, and I and I try to say it fairly to prospective clients. I'll say, look, uh, the guy at the brokerage firm across town. I, by the way, I'm thrilled that you want to allow me to manage half of your money, but I, I have sorry, I have to exit. I have to say, I have to decline. And and, be, and the reason that is, and I try to explain is, when I got into this business, I said I will never do anything that knowingly disturbs a client, and. What, the only thing I could say is true when you have two advisors, and that reminds me of an old saying, a man that chases two rabbits doesn't catch either one. And it kind of centers back to that. And it's, look, I can't tell you what the other advisor is going to do, but I can promise you this. We are likely to be, by magnitudes, much more diversified. And sometimes diversification works even when you wish it wouldn't. So sometimes non-diversified strategies will do better over the next block of time than diversified strategies. And what's naturally going to happen is, being a human being and hu human nature as a failed investor, is after three years go by, one person's performing much better than the other potentially, and what do investors naturally do? They get away from the defective strategy, the one that didn't work quite as well as the other, and they move their money towards the other. And it's probably just at the wrong time to do this. And that gets repeated over and over again. So I always tell prospective clients, look, I'm honored that you consider us for even half of your money, but we either manage the whole war or we'll manage none of it. I'm not suggesting you should pick us. I'm just saying you should pick one and be very careful with that choice. I think that's just better for people uh, for their long-term success. And that gets back to Fred. It's hard to have three people in your ear telling you what to do from a financial planning standpoint. Somebody needs to be the five-star general and take care of things. Well, and, because yeah. ultimately, sorry, uh, ultimately it won't be a financial plan. It'll just be a bunch of people with different market forecasts or ideas, conflicting ideas of what you should do, and you won't know who to listen to. Yeah, and sometimes like in uh, uh, investments for foundations, pension funds, and so on, you hire three or four different active managers who diff do different things. You put them all together, you have a high-cost index fund. Yep. That's <laughs> so, pretty common, isn't it, Fred? Yeah. Uh, do... Uh, how do boards know that? Do they have someone come in and say, well, look, you're supposed to have, you have consultant? consultants and yeah. so on, but you, I, you don't always know it until it's too it's, late. Sometimes it's uh, – and the fact that these managers can drift too. Yeah. So they may start out where you have three different managers that, you know, that appear to have different styles and a little different strategy, but over time they tend to drift and sometimes they can all drift together, and then you end up with Well, that. even if they're not drifting together, they may all set the best of one another and then end up with a de facto uh, uh, index. And I think that ha there's a lot of research that shows that that's kind of what happens. It's a pretty common thing to have happen. I, I saw it all the time at Dimensional, you know, advisors that were coming on board, just kind of new to the passive investment philosophy thing, and I'd see the portfolios they were using, and, yeah. you know, they'd, they'd basically be using all these active funds, but they end up with, 12 funds that end up covering the entire market, but the average expense ratio is, you know, 1.1%, which is exactly what Dr. Gertz was talking about, the most expensive index fund ever devised. 
And you didn't really have to guess at that. You guys had software that basically allowed you to kind of like do an MRI of all these funds collectively and say, well, this is where you are. Basically where you are is where the Vanguard total stock market index is on the plot. It's yep. just a lot more expensive. Um, David, one of the things uh, in that blog is you need the funding mechanism for your financial plans and retirement lifestyle, which is your portfolio. I always said a portfolio or money will never find your purpose, but it, it's there to fund your purpose. So what were you and Paul and you guys thinking when you kind of kicked this blog around about what is wealth management? Well, I think the investment portfolio honestly kind of speaks for itself, but it, like you said, it's the funding mechanism for the financial plan. And, and if you're developing a financial plan, usually what you'll find out is without a certain amount of stock market exposure in your portfolio or ownership of the great companies of the world, as you call it, your plan's really not going to work, or you're going to end up hampering your lifestyle so, so much that it's really not practical. It's, so, it's one way that some people would describe that as you're, you're going to fail slowly. Exactly. If you're, if you're almost exclusive for most people. Now, there's some people, if you have $100 million and you only need to spend 100000 a year, you can be in treasury bills and never have that risk. But for practical people, uh, for, for the day-to-day, -day, even the millionaires next door, if you have a 100% bond portfolio, you're probably going to fail slowly. I, I call it financial suicide yeah. on the installment plan. And I think at a more detailed level. You know, once you have that financial plan in place, the investment decisions become pretty easy because it's just, okay, let's build a globally diversified portfolio with the asset allocation that we need to make our plan work. Um, and as you said, that's going to include a variety of asset classes. And, and when you're doing a plan, it's not unusual where uh, there's kind of this range of stock market exposure. Uh, it might be you could do everything you want for with 40% of your money in uh, the great companies of America and the world with the rest of it, 60% being in bonds. Or you may have the same probability of exceeding those goals if you're 70% stock market and 30% bonds. Um, how is it you determine ultimately, if both of them have the similar probability of exceeding your expectations, um, which one do you, which, how, how do you end up picking that, that allocation? Is that part of attitude then? I think that's where the client's input comes in. You show them basically the impact because really the difference, it, although the probability of success is the same, the distribution of outcomes is going to be wider and the median outcome is going to be better for the higher equity allocation or higher stock allocation portfolio. And so you just talk about that. You say, look, Although it's not a lock, chances are, if you look at just the median outcome, increasing to you know 70% equity is going to end up with you know more potential for you to increase your spending over your lifetime, but also a little bit more potential for you to have to make cuts to your spending over sure. your lifetime because you got bigger downsides as well. Um, and chances are, if you again using like the median outcome, you're going to leave a bigger legacy to your children. And then it comes down to them, like, well, is it worth that extra fluctuation for the benefits that I'm receiving? So, so at that point, it becomes part of its attitude, just my attitude uh, for fluctuation. How much fluctuation? I want to be, you know, everybody wants to be uh, blissfully peaceful about their investments at night. But yet, at the same time, as advisors, we have to make people aware that they also have to fund three, two to three decades of rising cost. Uh, in retirement and and that's really and that kind of gets to the role of the trusted advisor Ryan um, I always talk about that's that person is that unique individual that has to call a truce between my near-term short-term emotional wants and my lifetime financial needs somebody needs to call a truce to that war and make peace is that what the role of the trusted advisor becomes then certainly it's it's the person who calls the truce. It's the person who might say, you know, you're doing well with the uh, the money that you have. You actually have the ability to spend more based on the plan and where your assets are. So it gives it gives them either an excuse to maybe spend more when they left on their own devices, maybe would not have spent more because they don't know the benchmarks and when they can free up some money. But the purpose of the advisor is to be that expert. And I think for the advisor, you have a two a two-part goal. One is to be the expert in your field, and you're, that's like the science of the of the craft. And then the art side of being an advisor is 
is being in tune with the person's emotional side, understanding their fears about investing, understanding if they're a newly retired person. We had a client who just emailed us this week about, I'm not sure I can take that trip this year because I might have to work some more. You have the ability, we have the ability to step in and alleviate that fear based on looking at the plan and knowing where the money is. And it puts people at ease to spend the money that they have because they've done well accumulating it. Yeah, now, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal last week that uh, <clears throat> said that the biggest fear of retired women, that they, they wanted to live to 100, but they were afraid of running out of money. So it's not necessarily you spend more, but you could reassure people that they're not going to run out of money. I, that's, we do that uh, probably every meeting. You know, it just there seems to be, again, now we're, we're, we are isolated in this area, this pocket of everybody that's our client um, is retired or they're about to be retired and th reassuring them particularly in that first two to five years of retirement that's that that's this is that or zone. after a spouse dies or that's another unique trigger you know that's oh my gosh there's not it's not like there's not enough thrown in at the same time but now all of a sudden and maybe you're a person that hasn't been responsible for financial the financial side uh, we're going to go I think we have John on the money. John, how can we help you? Yes, I have a question. Uh, maybe you can help me with uh, sure. the, uh, you know, when you're planning your retirement, and uh, what's the pros and cons between uh, having just a will or having a a trust? Okay, fair enough. So that usually they go hand in hand. Uh, do you want to do you want to listen or do you want to stay on the line, John? Uh, I'll listen. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you. And you guys chime in here. Um, in the back in the past, before living trust became really uh, popular, I'm going to drop that call here. Uh, Will's kind of r r ruled the day. Okay, here's here's what I have. Here's what I want to do. Well, if you just have a will and you have a certain amount of assets, and it doesn't, it's not a very high threshold that you have to exceed. Um, all of a sudden, you may have to go through what's probate, which means okay. You're going to have to hire somebody to close out your estate. It might take six to nine months of some legal work, going to court, et cetera. Uh, not particularly arduous. It just spent, you're going to spend a little money, and you're going to spend a little more time to close out the estate. The advantage of the living trust, the way I see it for most people, um, a lot of times the clients or prospective clients will ask, thinking there's some tax advantages. And for very large estates, there certainly can be to using trust. But for most people, it's just the orderly disposition of their estates is what I use or recommend um, living trust for. In other words, what you generally see is a lot of specific items. My, you know, my will might say, uh, I want my fancy car, which I don't have, to go to David. Uh, and I want, you know, jewelry to go to, to, to Daniel and et cetera, et cetera. That might be in my will. And then if to the extent I don't have, if I even have a living trust, sorry, Ryan, I left you and Katie out. That's right. Uh, but then a living, then it's what a pour over will. People say anything I haven't named in my will will go into my living trust. Now, if this living trust is already established, you really want to, the key is to have your assets that should be titled in that trust titled in the trust so that you can eliminate probate and it's also much more private if so a living trust basically nobody's it's nobody's business and nobody can go to the courthouse and look and see what you had in your estate from a living trust so it really allows for an orderly uh, distribution of your assets after when you wake up on a cloud as i put it it sounds better you guys want to add in on that you're certified financial I'll, planner you well and i'll just put my take on it i don't see a real strong reason not having a living trust if you have a reasonable amount of assets outside of just like retirement accounts right um it's like you said it just makes everything go smoother and quicker and it's a little less costly and it's not that expensive to have a basic living trust drafted so to me, it's like, why not do it and just make everything easier on your heirs? They're going to have enough to deal with just kind of dealing with your loss. And I just think and make it as easy as possible on them. It'll be money well spent. And even though you're retitling these assets in this trust, they're still your assets. You could do with them. You could put things in the trust, take them out of the trust at your convenience, at your leisure, at your will. Uh, so it's not as if you're tying this up in some format and giving it away. It's just it's still in your tax ID. Yeah. 
it's just going to be in the living trust dated 19, you know, 99, you know, for Paul Rudy, uh, title that date or whatever date it's formed. And then I go and I might put my house in that trust, or I might put my taxable brokerage account in that trust or a joint account or my checking accounts. And it allows for that orderly disposition and, and lack of probate privacy. It's not expensive. It's not exotic. It's really not so much tax driven in my view. And I think the majority of our clients have living trusts, it's fair to say. Mm -hmm. um, now, you know, you'll, you'll hear people do commercials on the radio and do seminars about living trust. I don't know what they're doing, why they're so excitable about living trust, Fred. Well, I think that, that's what I was going to say, that you want to have it done right. Uh, and in the past, I'm not sure whether this is still uh, acting now or not, but... Uh, People were trying to sell trust to farmers and yes. assuming that they could get all kinds of advantages and so on. And it turned out just to be a costly way of uh, rearranging things. So you want to do it just like you want to do your financial planning right. You want to do your legal planning correctly. Right. And, and again, as, as Dave said, th these are not exotic instruments. These are they're usually they go hand in hand. It's, it's, it's unusual almost anymore that someone doesn't have a will. That will doesn't say that if I forgot to put anything in my living trust, it goes into my living trust the day I wake up on a cloud. But the most important thing to do is if there's a reason to have a living trust, uh, fulfill the reason and get everything titled. And I think the important point that is not being said is just maybe to employ the help of an estate attorney. So none of us are uh, lawyers or attorneys. So we have our advice on it based on the financial world. But an estate attorney is somebody who will be able to give you the, the knowledgeable advice on what's best for your specific there's situation. no question about that. So yeah. I always t I've told the boys, I said, look, uh, our, our job is not to write trusts and write wills or any, a lot of these things. It's, uh, it's to spot the opportunity. Mm -hmm. That's what your financial advisor is going to do. They're going to spot the opportunity. Uh, any reasonably competent attorney can create a nice will and a trust. And then as long as you're doing that, get your durable health powers and get your property powers of attorney. Those are kind of the four horsemen that you want to get. Um, and you'll find that if you if you clean up all those things, if you have old ones, get them updated. If you don't have them, get them done. Um, all of a sudden, there is a certain sense of relief that people will tell us that, you know what, I've been dragging my heels, but now that we got it done, we just feel so much better and much more at peace. And I think most people think that it's going to be such a big, arduous mountain to climb, and, and that's like what you say, the relief. They got it done. It wasn't as bad as they had built it up to be in the first place, and really there's no reason not to do it. It's You're better off having had it done. A couple things I want to uh, talk about. Uh, Fred brought one up uh, last time he was on the show. We didn't get to it, but it was that issue with General Electric, and there was that article that talked about how, uh, as it said in the article, the rapid unveiling of GE has wiped out roughly $140 billion in stock market wealth in the past year. Not just big Wall Street <coughs> excuse me, firms, but among small investors as well. It's just to put it in perspective, people might, Fred, remember Enron back in right. 2000, 2001 that collapsed. All the employees basically not only lost their jobs, they lost all their wealth that was tied up in that, and a lot of it was. This is twice the amount of market cap uh, that's kind of disappeared. Yeah, and you hear the other side that uh, I was an employee of Google or something. Well, and you have huge. Uh, Windfalls, but there's the well, uh, Microsoft, that, there's Google, yeah. uh, there's there's lots of ones you could that you could look at and say, well, and here's what was going on, and we'll get back to that. Is uh, GE had an incentive plan that if you had a payroll deduction, they would match your savings in or investing, I should say, it's not savings in GE stocks. So a lot of these just linemen, you know, workers, just blue collar workers, were putting a lot of money, a lot of their retirement money, et cetera in GE stock and they didn't diversify and as Fred said you know yeah there's stories about Microsoft and Google that you know just people were smart enough or dumb enough not to sell any and they they were heroes and they became millionaires overnight and stayed millionaires uh, sometimes things work out and sometimes they don't though and the whole point is sometimes things don't work out and uh, so you had company retirees former factory workers that have just been really pretty much decimated. It's really changed their lives. Um, but it all gets back to, and we talk about this quite a bit on the, uh, quite often on the radio, when you have a, a, a non-diversified holding, a concentrated position, it just re represents a risk that you should not and don't need to take. And there's always a mechanism. All of these workers, just like Enron, they were not forced into these situations, and they always had the ability to diversify out of that stock as they were approaching retirement. 
and many of them chose not to, and they could have allocated that towards even something as simple as a Vanguard Total Market Index Fund, and they could have eliminated the disaster. And the whole point of diversification and why you don't want to have these concentrated stock positions is that you can't predict what's going to happen. Uh, you can gain a good sense <clears throat> on how we might respond if certain things do happen, but we can't we can't predict what's going to happen. And we have to think about all the good and the bad that can happen from taking on these risks, and then we have to plan accordingly around those. And it just sometimes it's the most, it's it's tougher than extracting a tooth, uh, trying to get somebody to uh, a tooth, a troubled tooth, a hidden tooth, <laughs> to get people out of their concentrated stock positions. We're going to go to Brian. Brian, thanks for calling. Paul Rudy's on the money. Yes, sir. Um, you gave uh, four documents that you said you should have a, a lawyer draw up. I, I didn't have a pen and paper. Could you go through those four again real quick? Yeah, the four horsemen is what I called them. Dave, you want to go through those or you want me to do it? You can do it. it okay, so matter. you want your basic will. You know, if you're married, you're both both of you, uh, you and your partner, going to want to have your basic will. Um, it's probably going to have some pour over type of effect. That if you're going to have the second document, which is the living trust, uh, you'll have the will and the living trust. You'll entitle things. You'll title things in your living trust. Some things might not be anything you forgot. The will's going to say it pours over into your will, but you want to talk to your attorney about this. I don't want to give out legal advice here. I'm just talking about typical things you see in these things. And then you want a durable health power of attorney. So if something happens to you, you become disabled or you go into the hospital and you can't think for yourself or speak for yourself, you want to have somebody appointed uh, and even back up people so you have that durable health power. There's different ways to get those structured, you know, when they uh, trigger and when they don't. And then the fourth one would be a property power of attorney. Again, you get into the disability or you just get in, you get in a position where you're just unable to think or deal with your own financial issues. You want to have somebody be able to act on your behalf. Maybe you need money uh, to pay for health care. Uh, maybe you need money for you know things to be done around the house. And maybe you simply, uh, a good example would be you have a stroke and you just simply can't even write your signature uh, to do that. So these are just things you want to get ahead of. Uh, it's not terribly expensive. Most people are pretty regular folks. It's a pretty standard issue. Uh, but when you say not terribly expensive, can you ballpark figure out what you should be put, putting out for these? Uh, standard issue, guys. What are you seeing in a range from could be five hundred to fifteen hundred dollars. I was going to say maybe an average is a thousand. I know what I spend on mine. I don't. I don't well, know was, if that's normal. Like five six hundred dollars for reciprocal wills and yeah, the same document. I think that's about. I, I would think uh, you should be able to get it done if there's nothing complicated. I'm talking about standard issue, and that's probably ninety percent of the people. Or I don't know. I'm just pulling that number out. But uh, I would think for less than a thousand dollars, you could get it done. Okay. Well, my book. That's not 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 terribly expensive, but. Uh, all right, thank you very much. Okay, thanks for calling. Yeah, you know, it's still $1,000 is $1,000, mm -hmm. guys. It's a lot of money, uh, but it's always that cost of the unseen, right. the cost of not doing it. Sometimes the cost comes in anguish, in pain, uh, in emotional pain, uh, because things just aren't cleaned up. And, and really, along with those four documents, uh, one of the things we've really focused on with our clients is trying to organize all their documentation that might be behind those. So those are some documents, but then there's going to be insurance policies, tax returns, uh, you know, there's you know brokerage statements. <clears throat> there are ways we use Everplans, which is really nice, and we do that for our clients, and that gives them the ability to basically digitally store all their key documents and simplify their life, organize their life, they can appoint anybody they want as a what's called a deputy, which means I might say, David, uh, you have access to my wills and my trust and my tax returns. Ryan, you have you know you have access to my brokerage firm uh, uh, statements because you maybe you have more aptitude towards that or something. And so I think along with those four documents, if you really want to cruise into retirement at a real peaceful level, you want to simplify and organize at the same time. And talk to your financial advisor about tools that they might have. <clears throat> Again, we use the Ever, uh, Ever Plans, uh, which our clients have tended to love. It's, it's, it's very methodical. It's kind of a baby steps way to do it. Let's get the big ones done first, get accustomed to it, and next thing you know, you know, in a 
period of weeks or months, you have all of your documentation and everything in order. Finally, guys, <clears throat> I'm going to briefly mention, we're going to cover more, and I, one of you, David, I think you wrote a blog. I think Carl <clears throat> Hospital, they have, they've had a pension fund for years, and there's going to be some changes to that. Like many companies, it just doesn't make sense to c continue to offer these defined benefit plans. Uh, everything I read, nobody's going to be harmed in this, so there's nothing wrong with this. I think it's perfectly common to do, but people are going to have a lot of some choices to make, and typically it depends on whether you're already taking a pension or not. You're not going to have a diminished pension. It's just going to probably be shifted from a, to an annuity payment, but not at a lower uh, the amount on a monthly basis than your pension is. Uh, for people that aren't taking it, you're going to be offered a lump sum or the ability, you could so you could take it all in cash, but you have to pay taxes. You could take a lump sum and roll it over to an IRA or to your other qualified plans like a 401k or 403b. Uh, in Carl's uh, case, they have both. So that's another option or an IRA outside of that. <clears throat> and of course, you could have them purchase an annuity for you. And again, it's not going to be less than the pension that they promised you. We've had a lot of questions from clients about this. David, you wrote a blog on that. You can get to that at rudywealth.com, I take it. Yep. And I've created a simulator program that's at the ready. It's a little early for this. But this is going to be a really big decision for a lot of people. It has a lot of consequences, and you want to go into this eyes wide open, and I think you want to get some really good advice from your advisor. Uh, if you need our thoughts on this, uh, we're happy to take calls or emails on this. We can run it through our simulator and probably give you a much better basis for making that decision between whether you're going to take a lump sum or continue taking an annuity payment. Uh, and so if that's going to be, that might be helpful to a, a large number of people. Again, uh, this is really common this day and age for defined benefit plans to basically be taken over by insurance companies. Nobody's harmed. Uh, and, you know, at worst case scenarios, you get the same promise payment for life that you were getting before. So there's, I, you know, I, there's no, nothing negative about it. Uh, for ha perhaps for a lot of people, it's going to be a really big positive, I think. There's going to be a large group of people, I suspect, that are going to want to take that lump sum. Now, now, you know, we're probably going to tell a good number of people to take the lump sum, or we're not going to tell them what to do. We're going to give them the basis to make the decision. When you're talking to your advisor, look, there's a conflict of interest here. I'm just going to say it. Um, a financial advisor or a registered representative with a brokerage firm, of course, they naturally want you to take the lump sum because they'll get to manage more money, and they'll get to make more money. Um, so that's a conflict that just needs to be discussed and really thought through, and you have to be comfortable with it. Well, we'll be back in two weeks. Thanks, Dr. Fred Gertz, uh, Ryan, and David. Thanks for joining us. Ed Bond, thanks. Thanks for listening to Paul Rudy's On the Money. Join us for the second and fourth Tuesday of each month for Paul